uh, see all of our upcoming meetings. You can click on those dates that are highlighted and get the topics, um, volunteer to speak, and it's going to default to showing now 2021 meetings, so upcoming meetings, everything in the future. But you can also look back, I believe, several years even and watch videos, any recordings of previous meetings as well. So our very next meeting is January 21st, but we also have a big announcement of an upcoming competition. Think, yeah. Okay, so I, we hope you guys are really excited about this. Uh, this is something we um, are really looking forward to. It is hopefully gonna be a way to get everyone engaged. Um, even though we're still virtual, we haven't done a contest or a competition in a while now. And although it would be really difficult to do one live together, we had an idea for putting together a contest and encouraging everybody at any type of skill level, however long you've been using Tableau, just to get started and build something with the software um, between now and April. So I think the next slide has a little more detail and I won't cover every single thing about the contest. Feel free to ask some questions if you guys want to. We can chat in the chat um, during some of the sessions. I'll answer questions. But just a high level, all of this is posted on our ATUG Slack channel. You'll notice if you go out there now, there's a new channel that we created called Iron Viz ATL, I think. So there's a flyer posted with um, even more details and information. So definitely go out there and, and check it out if you're interested. But we really want to encourage everyone to participate. So there will be a number of prizes um, for winning Vizs. And we want to encourage folks to participate. If they don't feel comfortable individually entering a competition like this, you can work in teams up to three people. And if I think Jen or whoever's running the slides, if you can click forward just once, there you go. All right, so here's kind of just a timeline outlining what is this all about and when would you get started and when would you need to submit a viz? So you have plenty of time. So the good news is you could start working now. There is no limit to the type of data that you can visualize. Just pick something that you're passionate about, really interested in. It could be a viz that you've been wanting to do for a while or perhaps something you've started. Um, we all have projects like that. So find, collect some data, start thinking about it now and just aim to have it done by the beginning of March. So March 1st, you would submit your visas. We would announce finalists at the March ATUG meeting. And then we would have presentations in April at the April ATUG meeting. Am I missing anything, Anna Nelson? I think you nailed it. All right. I hope everyone's really excited. Definitely check out the Slack channel for more information and feel free to ask some questions in the chat if you want more info. Awesome. And speaking of Slack, if you haven't already joined, definitely check us out. Um, if you want to just hold your phone up to the screen right here, this QR code will take you out to the Slack. Um, and you can also get there via, as uh, Karen was talking about, um, the dashboard that we've got or the Atlanta user group or the LinkedIn stuff. So uh, definitely continue the conversation out there on Slack. All right, Anna. Excited to have you intro. I'm so. really excited to introduce to everyone, Mr. Ben Jones, um, and honestly honored to introduce him. And I'm honored to call him my friend. Um, ben is here uh, via the Seattle, it's Bellevue, Washington, right? Yep, um, I'm in Bellevue. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Ben is the um, CEO and founder of Data Literacy, um, and you can find this on dataliteracy.com. Um, ben is, his passion is to teach people the language of data, which of course excites all of us here at ATUG because data literacy is one of our passions as well. Um, ben also used to work for Tableau and he did run Tableau Public for a long time. So, so that brings us to connect the dots with Tableau and with data literacy. Um, ben wrote the book, Communicating Data with Tableau. I read this one. <laughs> and 
avoiding data pitfalls, another really good one, especially if you're interested in data literacy. And then he also has the key traits of data literacy. And I believe you have a couple more coming out too. Um, so Ben, I, uh, I can talk all day about you, but what we're gonna do here is talk about the um, different pieces of data literacy. And we're gonna start with the barriers. So um, right now, Ben and I are gonna have a conversation, but we wanna do is just invite everybody to be engaged and talk to this, um, to the topics that we're gonna hit right here. So if you wanna chat or in the Q&A even, actually let's stick with chat right now. If you'll just chat any anything you wanna stick into our conversation here, because the first thing we're gonna start with in this conversation of data literacy is what kind of barriers that might you might come up against in um, when organizations are trying to unlock the value of data, what are those barriers that we run into? So um, we're gonna kind of start the dialogue and we'll start throwing out some things, but if anyone wants to jump in. Um, I'm gonna start by just this little quick chat. We talked about this the other day too, that um, I feel like data can intimidate people. So Ben, I want you to just kind of throw out to me what kind of things that you run into that intimidate yeah. people yeah. about data and what's our gatekeeper there? Yeah, sure. Uh, no, that's a great question. So before I uh, dive into that though, I just want to say thanks for the intro, Anna. I'm also really excited to be here chatting with a good friend of mine, uh, Anna Nelson as well. Going to chat with him and Karen. Um, and so, you know, big fan of ATUG. I know that you all have been uh, the one that set the trend. Now there's user groups all around the world. I actually ran the Los Angeles user group way back when, oh. before I went to Seattle to join Tableau. I guess it would have been like 2012, 2011, that time frame. You know, we would have to work real hard to get like five people to show up. So uh, those were the earlier days. Um, so I have a lot of respect for you all. And I know what it takes to pull together a presentation and speakers and managing it and all that. So definitely uh, thanks to all of you organizers of, of ATUG for getting this going and for inviting me. Really, really appreciate it. So with that out of the way, um, yeah, so we talk about data phobia, you know, this idea that um, a lot of people are still pretty afraid of data. So when I was running Tableau Public and using um, uh, that product with uh, journalists, mostly training journalists, you know, journalists, there's some fabulously talented data journalists around the world that really push the boundaries of what we know how to do with data. And I'm a big fan of, of a lot of their work. But when we were working and traveling around going to these journalism conferences, we started to realize that, you know, many, many journalists didn't go to journalism school because they like data. It's because they like stories, people, photographs, video. That, that was really their medium, you know, and now they're trying to kind of get caught up with this wave of data journalism and learning Tableau Public to do that. And so we would train big conference rooms of people from everything from the BBC down to, you know, I don't know, smaller local, even one time I got to do it like a community newsletter uh, conference out in Missouri, uh, um, Columbia, Missouri, and where there were people that were, you know, running like tiny little newsletters for a uh, 200 person town. And hey, what can they use data for, you know, for the town budget or so. And, and this data was not their language, not their medium, not their thing. And they were freaked out by it. So we were helping them get past some of those barriers. So uh, I started to, as I began to work with um, my own clients here in data literacy at this company that we're running, we started to uh, realize that, you know, companies are many people within companies facing some of these same barriers. So we started to do this program. In fact, we launched it back in January of this year, right before everything went haywire. <laughs> so, but it's called the Data Literacy Score. And so what we do with that is we work with organizations to assess where they are. You know, we've been doing training for a couple of years, but inevitably in the first year, people would ask us, how do we know how well we're doing? How do we benchmark? How do we figure out if we're making progress? Those kinds of questions would always, always, always came up. So we designed this data literacy score team-based assessment. And so we've been working with organizations now for a little less than a year to ask them these exact same kinds of questions. What are the barriers you're facing? What are the challenges you're facing? And so, you know, data phobia, yes, there are a percentage of people in every single company that really feel left behind. They feel like data is not their thing. 
you know, um, they went to maybe a liberal arts school, which is great. I mean, they're also people with that background, by the way, that are uh, at the top of the field, you know, so it isn't like that means they can't get there. Um, I think of people like Lindsay Betzenhall, who for many years was a, a family uh, psychologist therapist, right? So many people with a, um, you know, more uh, sort of less, let's say less data centric uh, formal education have embraced data. And Tableau has been a way for them to, I think, transition into data working in their career. But when we talk to companies and we say, hey, what's your big, biggest single barrier? We hear lots of different answers and why don't we throw some out there? So, you know, one that, um, that I hear a lot, right, is just this idea that people don't really trust the data yet, you know, um, and that's maybe because they see errors in it. That's maybe because this that dashboard doesn't match that dashboard. So there's a big trust gap, I think, for many people in order. We got it literally as you said it in the yeah. chat. We got uh, Coleman uh, quality, says data you know. quality right yeah, there. Yeah, Coleman nailed it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's an eroder of data trust. So I start to see all these glitches and errors. And I mean, we know, you know, those of us who have worked with data for any length of time know that. I mean, there's no perfect data sets, you know, dirty data is the norm. It's just a question of how dirty is it? Just like technically, you know, your countertop, right? Might have a huge copy spill on it. Well, I gotta wipe that up. But you know, if I go down to the molecular level, yeah, there's lots of little imperfections. And sometimes those become significant depending on the question you're asking of that data. And so that's a big issue I see. Um, uh, how about, uh, back to you, uh, Anna, what, what's another issue you see? I, um, I like that Cindy added here that people asking for metrics that don't actually provide value or performance uh, yeah. insights. Yeah. And actually I can map that back to my previous experience in education um, and marry that with what we were saying earlier about people's um, kind of phobia of data because we have people who are being asked to, um, in their job, in my job it was education, so it was a lot of teachers being asked to track metrics and track data that um, was intimidating, but they also were saying, they're able to say the same thing that, yes, I don't know exactly how to work with data, but I can tell you this metric is not measuring this thing. <laughs> right, right. You think it's telling you that, but yeah. So this then when you me... have that, I would even no. drop it up some further. Then you have pushback. Right. Yeah, sorry, right. go ahead. Oh yeah, no, and for good for good reason. I mean, and, and, and in that book, Avoiding Data Pitfalls, you mentioned, um, I talk a little bit about this. You know, uh, there was this article that really made me laugh. It was a, it was last year, 2000, maybe 2018. And um, so LeBron James, you know, he was in the playoffs. I think in that year he was still playing on the Cavs, not before he, before he went to the Lakers. And so he was in the Eastern Conference Finals and a, a reporter came to him after a game and said, hey, uh, Mr. James, did you know that you're the slowest player in the entire playoffs? There's no one running slower at a slower speed than you, you're dead last. And so he was a little irritated to say the least and he says, in colorful language, you know, that's a stupidish bull, blah, 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 I've ever heard. <laughs> okay, then he goes on to say, why don't you track how tired I am after the game? Maybe, maybe that would be interesting. And so I, I, would, I sat back and I thought after cracking up, you know, this guy obviously high performer to say the least. Um, and so here he is, you know, not liking the fact that he's being measured in a negative way against his peers. And so I thought about it and in the book, I kind of said, uh, you know, there's three kinds of ways you can measure performance. There's one uh, would be, I would call it like opinion metrics. What does someone else think of you and how well you did? Now, this is pretty common in business. What, how do your employees, your peers rate you? What does your boss give you, you know, on a scale of whatever, one to five? So these are opinion metrics. What do people think of you? The second would be activity metrics. How much did you do something? And this was essentially what LeBron was being presented with, an activity metric. How much did you run around? So in theory, I could sprint around the court and completely ignore the ball and like be in first place on that metric and like would do right. no good to my team, right? And be a complete liability. So uh, that's an activity metric. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, Microsoft just uh, released something similar to this productivity metrics. How many emails did you send? How many minutes did you join a meeting? How many times did you at somebody on your team? Okay. So these are activity metrics. How much did you do something? And those aren't necessarily evil. I'm a little worried about the, pro, the pro performance or the, so the productivity, they call it productivity metrics, but it's really just engagement activity metrics. I wouldn't want to sit with my boss and say, Hey, your emails are down 20%, you know, 
I mean, I don't want to have that kind of discussion because I think the third type of metric is the most important one, which is performance metrics, right? So how much do impact metrics, how much do what you do actually impact the bottom line, move the needle. And so if we're not using those metrics, then people start to just get irritated about data. Like LeBron got irritated about that reporter's question, you know, um, because I'm trying hard, I'm making results and all you're doing is coming in and measuring how fast I'm running around, how many emails I'm sending. Um, so is that what data is for? Is it data to kind of be the cop to see if I'm still logging in? So I'm going to log in and then walk away. So but it still shows I'm people can game those metrics, you know? So anyway, yeah, that's a big erosion, eroder of data, data trust. And, and I'll never forget, I have to yeah. butt in that, um, and I, just to toot your horn there, because you wrote an article about that, that, that I never will forget when data is the dumbest <clears throat> word yeah. that LeBron <laughs> said. Right. Well, yeah. you also pointed out in that article, uh, and this will bring us to the barriers again, because you pointed out what metric was a better metric. And I forgot the name of the metric. You might remember off the top of your head. It was a metric. Oh yeah, player in PIE. So, yes. for, for so actually, not a I went so far at the time and looked up the calculation for PIE. It is such yeah. a huge mathematical calculation that's weighted yeah. averages and everything that yeah. going back to barriers, if we are going to find the right metric, uh, sometimes uh -huh. the right metric is intimidating again. Yeah. And we're going back to the whole, well, this is dumb. Let's just use speed. Let's yeah, just yeah. measure well, so <laughs> speed because I don't even know how to calculate this, right? Yeah, so it's fascinating you bring that up, this idea that sometimes the what's behind the calculation is so complex and so opaque that it actually becomes itself this fear-inducing element of the data. I just tweeted yesterday a really great article out of the MIT Technology Review about how this exact concept applies to uh, credit scores as well as benefits algorithms that various public agencies, state health departments use to determine who gets in-home care, how much in-home care, all of those things. And so the people that purchase and use those algorithms off the shelf don't really themselves know what those algorithms are saying or doing, or even what inputs go into them. And many times they have, they have errors, and these are tragic for people that result in them losing their benefits, you know, being left out in the cold, not getting access to loans and things like that. And then it's really tough to peel back the layers of the onion to figure out what exactly is going on there. And so this can be a really uh, big problem for organizations as they also maybe have some fairly complex metrics that they're using. And your average Joe is really going to just scratch their head and walk away. And, and so they need to, I think, um, find ways to explain in simple layperson terms what are the metrics. And to your point, maybe also they should ask themselves, does it need to be this complex? Is it useful or helpful? Does it add value that we're adding in? It's always, it's sort of it, the evolution of, of using data. It, it probably tends to be more and more and more complex. Oh, let's add this component. Let's add this factor or, or variable. And then it just grows and gets bloated. And at some point you look at it and go, I don't even know what it is anymore. You know, it's just so, so crazy and, and whatnot. So we're going to have to move to the next topic in okay. just a second here, uh -oh. but I did want to throw out just a couple couple more barriers that we talked about earlier so people can think about these as we head into the next conversation. But we talked a little bit about the um, the silo data, data is all over the place. We can't even get to it, that being another barrier. And also those gatekeepers keeping us from, well, we, we know where it is, but do you really yeah. need it? So um, we, we do access. have a couple yeah. minutes or a minute or so for a Q and Are we going to do the Q&A? Okay. So do we have a question, Karen? On the barriers, I'm looking through, I, I see a lot of like people have a lot of um, have suggested a lot of thoughts around barriers, but not so many questions. Okay. Um, well, with that, great we points move. in here though. Yeah, interactivity barrier. This is from Michael Lane. Users might not be professionals, so they don't know the variables in the data or not familiar with Tableau. This is actually a big one. So I, I work with this one organization that did an audit there. That's what their, their function was. And they were saying, we don't really know the business meaning of the data, mm -hmm. the variables. We see them, we're looking at them, but we don't really know what they mean. Um, and this is common, I think, when you have like um, grouped analytics teams, which is actually, I would say, probably the best practice to have a team of experts. Oftentimes you're going to sit there and say, well, I can look at the numbers, but I don't know what they mean. I don't really understand their impact or their importance. So there's this data knowledge 
bucket. And then there's this business acumen or applicational knowledge bucket. And so sometimes because of the way we group our teams, we have people that are experts in one of those buckets, but not the other. And so the question is, how do you bring those together so that I understand the data, but also what the data means, you know, in terms of its connection to the real world. All right. With that, That's we're cool. going to move to, uh, you're going to, going to Karen's going to introduce a next topic here on our conversation of data literacy. Yes. And so I think this slide is kind of our transition into this next section. So here we're really just going to have a discussion around, Ben, we'd love to hear your thoughts on potential ways organizations can unblock some of these challenges, these things we've talked about, and we've kind of like touched on some of them, but how do you start to head in the right direction? Yeah. Yeah. So it's easy. <laughs> it's sort of depressing to sit here. If we only had a conversation about all the challenges and barriers. So how do we get past them? How do we get over those hurdles um, in front of us? You put a big spring on your shoe. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, <laughs> so, all right. So, well, we've got to kind of, what we do with our data literacy score is we're taking a look at it from sort of seven different factors that I think oftentimes maybe people don't really think of all of them, but, and so just to kind of mention them briefly, and then I'll dive into a couple, I think maybe practical things to get started. So the first is, you know, purpose. So is your data connected to what your team is actually trying to accomplish the goal or are your, I think this happens a lot of times we hire data experts, what do we do? We put them on these side projects that mean nothing, you know, and they get very frustrated because they're not really doing anything. They're not really contributing in a way that, you know, they're, they're really smart people. They want to contribute. And so is data being used to actually move the organization or is it being used for pet projects that they really don't move the needle? Uh, and this relates to this whole idea of how are we even tracking our progress? And, you know, do we have the right metrics in place to know if we're uh, moving in the right direction. So there's that purpose connection. There's also one we left behind is ethics. I mean, it, no one wants to work on a team or for a boss that's using data for harm. I don't want to, you don't want to. And if that's the case where we don't have good sound ethical principles in place, I can pull the red cord if I see a problem or realize that there's an error or a way that bias is being propagated or a privacy concern, blah, 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 right? If I fear what will happen if I do that, I don't know if I want my team to be data literate in that environment. They better not be because we got to fix that first. So ethical principles. Then we get into this trifecta, right, of people, process, technology, this, this triad. So, you know, you need to have people that know what they're doing with data skills wise, but we also need to have the right technology in place. We also need to have processes that allow us to actually use that technology. What good is it to have talented people with amazing, powerful tools like Tableau? but the process doesn't even let them give input to the decision. Now they're sitting there saying, well, that all happened in a different room with people that didn't really ask what the data was saying. And that can be very frustrating. We've all been there. Uh, and then clearly we can think about the data itself. That's another category here, the quality of the data. Last category uh, being one that I think Tableau has put to the forefront is this idea of, of data culture. So does our organization reward people who are um, uh, successful with data? Do they get the chance to uh, talk about their wins? Uh, do they get rewarded and promoted and, and such? Um, do we have communities, meetups, resources that we can engage in uh, that to help me get better? And I feel like as an average employee, this business is investing in me to get better at data. They're providing me access to really cool, fun, and interesting things like your Iron Viz uh, contest that, that get me, they get me going. So these are the seven factors. And I think that you look at each one of these and say, well, we've got to find solutions in each one of these in order for us to really move forward. And maybe what is the blocker right now? What's the priority for us to move forward? So I would, when I work with organizations, that's the first thing I'm trying to figure out is where are the biggest, where's the bleeding, you know, in those, in those different areas. Um, because we've got to make sure that you put the foundation of the house before you put the walls up, you know, so that kind of a thing. I start with that. No, that's, that's excellent. And what you were saying about culture, that um, when Anna and Nelson and I were like brainstorming just on some of these topics and just trying to think through, you know, questions ask you and having this discussion, culture yeah. came up a lot and like right. what type of culture. So in your experience, like working with different companies, 
have you seen any best practices to maybe like cultivate a culture that promotes like data literacy? What have you seen that is like the most beneficial? Yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to reading Ava Murray's book, Empowered by Data. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm interested in her thoughts on this topic uh, more than anyone really. But my own opinion, um, both being in what I think was a fairly uh, successful data culture within Tableau, as well as, um, you know, before that at Medtronic, medical device manufacturer, um, is that you're going to be able to get access to training, but training is not everything. You know, I would love to have someone out there that's letting me know about a good data book that's new and giving their thoughts on that. So there's maybe a book club. There's a single place I can go that this whole thing is hosted in a fun and interesting way. You know, maybe that's a Slack channel for me or you, maybe that's a, even a simple, you know, just website where we're putting that together uh, and putting resources in people's hands. It's gotta be optional, these meetups, lunch and learns, brown bags, whatever you wanna call them, because people are already so inundated with Zoom meetings. We're doing one right now that uh, the last thing we wanna do is like coerce people into participating. It just really zaps the fun out of everything. But in, in other words, there's someone who's saying to themselves, how am I adding in a value that people wanna show up without them being told they have to, you know? So those are the things I think that people who have embraced this idea of a data community, data culture, internal to the organizations are all uh, trying to do things like that, little contests. But I know from running Iron Viz for many years that uh, contests are tricky, you know, people get competitive. And so how do we set the stage and make sure the tone is correct and have it be fun and not uh, something that maybe uh, you know, it's hard to avoid really, honestly, with a contest. I don't really want to go down that rabbit hole, but the point is you run a contest, people compete, people get competitive. How do we make sure, and someone's got to really think that through. How do we make sure this is fun and engaging, not competitive? And most times there's not, but there's always a few people that, you know, need to be had, need to be chatted with or something. Anyway, that's another story. But those are, I think, some of the elements of uh, a cool uh, data community internal to an organization um, some of the, I guess, maybe practical components of what I've seen. No, those are excellent. And I feel like you hit the nail on the head as far as things like that. Like when you really want culture, you can't force that on people. It mm -hmm. has to be like kind of organic. And, you know, you made a comment about almost about like having kind of people that are almost internal to the company, like champion this yeah. idea. And earlier, I think maybe when you were talking to Anna, you're, you mentioned, you know, giving incentives, like if others can see that like, hey, those among us that are the most like data literate and are very successful, like driving data oriented decisions, they're the ones getting promoted and going places here in the organization. I think that kind of yeah. like also helps with the culture for sure. I think so. Success breeds that and people notice what gets uh, rewarded. Uh, that speaks volumes in a company. You can have your code of conduct, you can have your pillars and principles, but at the end of the day, someone gets promoted because they are the same jerk that the boss is, or they, you know, flatter the right person. Well, people get that, they hear that. And so um, when I was in uh, the whole Lean Sigma thing, which was this, I think it was almost a little overly done, but let me just describe the way that worked. We had different belts. So that was already a little hokey, but fun in a way, I guess. We did training, we had projects. There was a star of excellence award where people would win. It was very program heavy, really, really program heavy. Lots of layers and elements of this very kind of official program across this uh, Fortune 500 company that I was a part of. And so like I said, I think that there's a backlash to that if you overdo it, you gotta be careful with that. That being said, people really cared about winning these project awards. It was a big deal. And you know, those people that got it did get chosen for leadership positions. And so people were jumping on this bandwagon like crazy. And so um, again, I, like I said, I think it was overdone though, right? Because then, you know, there's a shelf life to some kind of very heavy handed initiative like that. But at the same time, what I learned about it is that people pay attention to what gets rewarded. People pay attention to who gets opportunities and spotlight. Um, we also want to make sure and go out of our way to make sure 
that that's a diverse sort of a um, reality in our company. Um, and so, uh, but you know, those to me are, yeah, like, you know, we need to ask ourselves those questions. What are the things that get people to get, um, you know, develop their careers here um, to continue to, you know, be able to contribute at a higher and higher level. Uh, those are really important aspects. We can talk about uh, solutions like data catalogs. Those are great. We need some way to bring in metadata and descriptions. Yes, there's those technical solutions. We've got to think those through. Uh, at the same time, there's the cultural pieces, which if we forget, then we just get a bunch of fancy tools in the garage that nobody ever takes around the block, you know? And um, exactly. Yeah. I'm trying to think of other. So I see a few questions. Oh, yeah. Nelson, did you, did you have any that you want to bring up? Well, you know, it's interesting, y'all. I think, um, <clears throat> again, kind of like what we had before, there's a, a bunch of great comments in the thread, um, yeah, in, in the chat. Um, you know, everything from, you know, how do we do sprints and talking about doing, you know, biweekly backlog grooming sessions, you're know, talking about doing kind of knowledge bites, doing internal user groups. Um, you know, there's a ton of different stuff. One of the things that we talked about yesterday was kind of referencing some of the organizations that we know of that are out there that are that are doing some things really well, at least you know, from the outside looking in. And we talked about folks like the JLLs. Um, we talked about Comcast uh, up in Philadelphia is doing some great stuff. Uh, UBS with Paul Benoob. Uh, he's another you know, leader who, who's really got his arms around, you know, what does it look like to run a center of excellence? Um, and so, you know, I think it, it's really looking at some of these organizations and, and, and learning, um, but also, you know, Ben, as we're about to talk about here, it, it's bringing it all together. Um, and it, it, and uh, you know, I thought, Ben, you, you had a great point as you were starting to get on with Karen about having the vision. Um, you know, what does it look like um, that we, we have a definition of success? Um, and so as, as we kind of wrap up with this third part here, you know, the, the big question here is, you know, what do other parts of a thriving data literate culture look like? And, yep. and Ben, if, if we could, I, I'd love to just start with that big piece. Um, and, and I think having a vision of, of what does success look like? How do we define it, you know, it, at the larger organizational level? Sure. But also, you know, in HR and, and in um, logistics and inside of marketing and, and right. And so that people have an understanding of, Hey, what are we trying to do here? And how do we know when we've been successful? And I think incumbent in that is a, is a marriage between the, uh, the, the strategy of that part of the organization with the analytic insight. And so I'd love for you to maybe dig in, um, on how do you see those things getting brought together really well? Yeah. I think that there's this flow down of metrics that we need to, uh, define. So we talk about saying, well, what does success look like? Um, and then what are the, the KPIs, key performance indicators that are connected to that? Um, but to, you know, you really, it can be easy if we just stop there, that we create a situation where when someone, I used to say comes into work, now I guess they just log into work, but uh, you know, well, what, what are they going to do today? And how can we give them uh, the ability to see that what they're going to do today is actually contributing? And sometimes that gulf can feel large for them. And so we try to use this goal tree approach to say, well, what's your KPI? Now let's actually literally break that down. I mean, sometimes even in an equation, what are the elements of that metric and how do we touch those different elements? So let's say, I don't know, we're talking about a marketing team and they're looking at growing an overall, uh, let's say, um, you know, marketing leads or something like that. Okay, well, we can break that down. Where are the leads coming from? Um, how do we look at it from a traffic versus a conversion rate perspective? These are actually factors that you multiply together and add together in very relatively simple mathematical equations that at the end, give us that overall goal. Now I might be running an event in marketing. Okay. What am I doing? Well, I'm trying to add leads to the, the pile. Okay. Well, what am I doing with that? I'm trying to get exposure to that, get signups for that. And so, okay, I can see now that that actually, that activity that I'm going to sit here and spend my time doing is going to contribute in a, in a very specific and measurable way to the overall goal. And so I think that that's a starting point because now people already get motivated and they're excited about contributing. Most people want to contribute, you know, most people that's, 
the idea of not contributing is sort of not fun for anyone. So paint the picture for them. What does contributing look like? How do you measure that? How do you see the contribution in as quickly as possible connected to the activity itself? So I get that sense of, of moving this football down the field, you moving the chains and getting closer. Um, and then you're going to get people that are going to be dialed into the data, if they're data people or not. Um, and then also thinking through, okay, not everything is going to be measurable like that. Not everything is going to be a simple calculation like that or an equation. So how do we also balance this overall picture so that we do take into account maybe some softer metrics that are not maybe quote unquote data informed. And that's okay too, you know, um, it needs to be balanced. It needs to be, be holistic like that. That's probably an overused butchered word, but the point is let's not get so data focused that we lose sight of the intangibles. And let's also make sure that's part of it so that people don't feel like data is becoming now almost too much of a focus. So, you know, I need to leave room for people's intuition and gut. I need to honor the fact that their experience might be something that's difficult to put into um, X and Y form, right? So I guess those are other things to ask ourselves as we try to balance out this data culture that we don't go too data heavy on it, I guess is maybe what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, but, does that make sense, but, Nelson? What do you think about that? Well, I love what you're saying. I think one of the things that we used to describe um, as I as I ran larger teams and talked about, you know, how do we how do we lead our different teams and, and you know, kind of what's what's one of the, the things that becomes an inflection point for folks who are kind of getting into data, but they're, they're very much in kind of a doing role. And, and you know, what's one of the things that we see that uh, leaders and organizations have a different mindset on and, and you kind of touched on it, you know, I, I use the terminology of, you know, leaders see the forests and sometimes the doers will just see a tree. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I love what you were talking about where, you know, conceptually what we want to be able to do is make sure we understand the greater purpose. And, you know, oftentimes we'll, we'll work with a, uh, an analyst or a part of an organization kind of say, hey, can you tell me what the vision statement of this organization is? Can mm -hmm. you tell me what the mission statement of this organization is? Yeah. And do you feel personally connected to it? Does it yeah. get you out of the bed in the morning? And, and do you understand, and I love how you described it. It's like, hey, let's talk about the entire process of how this organization does what it does and, mm -hmm. and serves you know, uh, the marketplace or the community or whatever it is. And hey, this is our slice right here. And mm -hmm. so when we're doing what we do well, here's, here's how it has, you know, a downstream impact and, and here's, you know, what has to happen before we even get to it. Right. And so I love your, how you kind of talked about, you know, understanding that, that larger process um, of, and where you fit in, it gives you a chance to understand where your impact is going to be. And then yeah, there's, a, there's a lot yeah. of value in simple flow diagrams and swim lanes. These are really simple diagrams, boxes and arrows, and they help you see where things go in the bigger picture. Because I actually hear that a lot with the companies I work with people, especially and compounded by the fact that the data is disparate. They'll say, well, we see our tiny little piece, but we don't really see how it fits. We don't see the bigger picture. We feel like there's data out there that we should be thinking about or caring about, but we're not connected to it. And so no one's helped us see that bigger picture yet and where we fit in. And I think that that is the job of middle management, really. That's the job of your managers, your, your uh, directors, to be able to help their teams see where their function fits into this bigger picture and what it all means, you know, help them kind of grasp this overall journey that the co company's on and the part that they play and help them see that that's a meaningful part, you know? Um, and so, yeah, uh, I think that there are some simple little diagramming kinds of tools we can put in place along with the data. You know, sometimes we say to people, well, don't just make a big dictionary of your data terms. Like, yes, you need that. But before you do that, we've got to also say, how do you take that dictionary of data terms and like, what's the closet it goes in, right? How do I connect this to the process? How do I connect this to the value stream that um, my organization is converting raw materials into products, into value? Okay, what's at a high level? What is that value stream? Maybe it isn't just a product development value stream. It could be order to cash value stream. It could be supply chain value stream. That is part of the product value stream, but you know, maybe it's idea to development. We're talking about development. Maybe it's the value stream is talent, bringing talent in the organization. 
So then, um, you know, okay, what is that value stream? What's the process? Now that we know that, what are the many different systems? And that's the reality today for most organizations. There's a few couple, maybe main ones, lots of ancillary ones, lots, as we all know, of one-off little spreadsheets here or there and tables in random places. So I don't know if I need to get down to all the nitty gritty at this point. I'm just wanna say, what are the, what's the big picture? What are the main uh, data sources connected to that value stream? And then what are the main variables in each one of those? Let's just start there. Let's just yeah. do like a top five, top three exercise and say like, can we capture you know, the, the bulk of it? And just like how far, how, how familiar do people pe feel with that highest level? Um, and many times I think we find we work with organizations, they don't really know, they don't see that. And no one's painted that picture for them and they don't know who to talk to to get it. So I think that that's an important piece of it. So Ben, I, I love this conversation. You know, <clears throat> another piece that uh, you brought up a minute ago with Karen uh, is, you know, when we think about a, a comprehensive solution, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah. we think about a comprehensive solution um, when we're coming in to, to work with a client, uh, to, to work with a part of a, a, a particular organization, you know, yeah. we often talk about, you know, the three things that you brought up, the people, the process and the technology. Um, you know, you mentioned just a minute ago, you know, strong recruiting, um, you know, having bright and talented people, uh, you know, in some ways it's table stakes, but it's really hard to do. And then once the people are in the organization, you know, I, I thought we might touch on a couple of things that of how we can invest in our people, um, mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, again, kind of if, if we've got folks on here that are in kind of a, a middle management or middle leadership or, um, you know, even some of your, your VPs of analytics or, or data or, or C-level folks, um, yeah. a couple of things that you can kind of infuse and, and any other of the other pieces that you want to talk about on, on process and technology as well. Yeah. So the people part of it is so interesting. I hear a lot of this, right? Someone goes out there, they get, some math, they get a master's degree in data science. Then they get hired by this Fortune 500 company. They're super excited. They come in the door, and then they just make reports, you know, um, and they get really frustrated, and then they leave. And probably about a year, maybe two years, and they say, "Well, what, what's missing for them?" Well, I think a few things. Right? One is that um, the trouble was the organization that hired them didn't really know what they could do. Didn't really understand what it was that they could contribute. So part of I think what the hiring manager needs to do is understand how uh, different data skill sets can be um, applied to scenarios that maybe they're not thinking about right now. Also, I found that many times they just want to be part of the conversation, you know, and, and that's, and what I mean by that is um, they want to be heard. Like is data actually part of the decision-making process here? Or did you want to have your chief executive brag about all your data talent, but you didn't actually want to use that talent, like almost like a, uh, I don't know, Jay Leno having a, you know, 15 garages of amazing cars that never get driven or whatever, right? So it's actually, how do we take them around the block? How do we then actually get to the grocery store with that car? Um, and not to compare people to cars, but my point, I guess, is that uh, the people that are or are leading the organization need to understand what it is that those individuals can do. And then uh, many times they don't. So then if they can figure that out, oh, this is what someone could in theory do. Now the next question is, well, are you then using them for that? Are you, are you allowing them to, um, to, to get to work and, and to actually uh, brainstorm, think outside the box? Most very talented people want to be creative, want to not be overly limited by processes that tie their hands. You know, most times I guess they have, for large companies anyway, they're going to have access to the most powerful technologies and the technologies are so powerful today. Many of them are open source, you know, but um, so that's another story. But I think they're probably going to have the tool. I don't hear a lot of times people saying, I, I didn't get tools I needed. Um, I think that still can happen to access to technology can still be a problem in many places. But, you know, most times you can get those tools. But the problem is you don't actually get to use them um, in, in real. I had an interesting experience when I was uh, at Medtronic where I was playing around with survey data and I was using a data mining algorithm using a software tool called Jump. But uh, point is that I was using this uh, sort of machine learning algorithm to go through the data. This is before it was a, a fashionable thing to do. This would have been like 2010, 2011. And we we're just trying to see what are the main ways that someone's satisfaction, like what are the factors that seem to contribute the most to someone's satisfaction with the company? And we found out that it was uh, product quality, um, was the biggest 
was the biggest concern about a specific product. It was an insulin mm -hmm. pump. And it was, and then we went down the tree from there. But the point is like, nobody cared. It was like this interesting thing. And we were trying to present and tell people about it. Nobody cared. And then we started, and then we, like about a couple weeks later, we had a recall. Oh, that same th single product that the quality and their perception of the product quality was the single biggest driver of their satisfaction. We have to recall it. And so uh, we were saying, uh-oh. But what the tree told us was that we could, even if they didn't think very highly of the product quality, we could regain their high opinion of us if we gave them really amazing uh, service on the timing of this consumables product they needed to use. It was essentially the tubing that goes along with this insulin pump. And if they thought that we were really on the ball with that, you know, even, even the people who weren't thrilled with the pump quality, you know, this is the way the decision tree works, even those individuals. So we were able to, now all of a sudden, this analysis became anything any executive was talking about. So what was missing at the first was a connection to a real business need, a problem, an urgent problem. We have a massive recall. We're now freaking out, you know, we being everybody up to the CEO. And so then are we allowing them to be creative and think outside the box and use new approaches to some of the things that matter the most, as opposed to it started off as a little pet project, you know, and I, I luckily stumbled into it being um, something actually highly relevant. So I don't think people that are highly talented that get brought into teams want to use their amazing skills on pet projects that don't move the needle. Uh, at the same time, you know, there's this uh, hesitancy to when it really, really matters, right, to include people that aren't at an executive level in the conversation, to be open to interesting new approaches at, at mining data to look for uh, inputs there. And so that takes guts on the leadership point of the par part. That takes guts on their part to say, we're going to be vulnerable here and bring other people into this conversation that aren't in the club or whatever you want to call it, okay? And so then, you know, when you find those leaders, you really want to work hard for them because you get to you get to go to bat. Absolutely. You get to go to bat. Yeah, and, and Ben, as we're as we're wrapping up here, one of the things that I, I really hear you saying to us, and and you know, one of the things that I, I I I hold this very dear is ultimately the success of analytics is that we improve the organization. And if we if we as an organization are aligned that improvement of the organization and helping the organization go further faster to accomplish its mission, to accomplish its vision. And to your point, in the moment when whoever the right person to give us that answer or to give us um, the ability to go further faster, whether it's you know the analyst that's been here for a year or it's the, the CDO or, or the, the CEO, let's get that person in the room because if we're all agreed that, that that's the vision, then, then those are the organizations we want to work for. Um, yep. Last few things, you know, it, it's been such a, uh, you know, we've had some great, great comments. Uh, Coleman's has some great comments talking about, um, you know, the focusing on having like a dashboard methodology. One of the things that we talked about in our process piece here um, and then kind of just the marriage of, you know, we talked about uh, from the outset, looking at that strategy, you know, the organizational strategy married, the uh, the analytic insight and, and you know i think we all you know it's tempting to kind of say technology is the silver bullet that solves everything but it, yeah. we should all know that that's not true right and so it's when those two concepts really get married you know we can't just strategize this thing and not have any data that won't help us either so right. it really is bringing all these things together so uh, i've really uh, loved and appreciated this um oh, me too but, Ben, I, I think maybe I'll close this out. And then, um, you know, on behalf of our group here and, and ATUG, um, it, it, in general, it just is so great to hear from you. Great to see your, your smiling face. Um, you know, you're welcome back here uh, whenever, whenever you can, can be here. And, uh, you know, love to, to host you once all this pandemic stuff is over. But uh, really looking forward to your next book, Ben, um, and super grateful for, for all your help. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Nelson and, and Anna and Jen and Karen. Really, really appreciate giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts. And uh, you want to wish you all happy holidays for all the folks there uh, listening in. Um, what a tough year, 2020, huh? But, you know, we made it. Here we are. And we're going to uh, turn a corner here, 2021. It's going to be a great one. And I'm hopeful that uh, you thrive in that new year. And um, hopefully data is a piece of that and that you continue to grow in your own uh, journey uh, into data literacy, becoming more fluent uh, every single week that goes by. So thanks for including me, everyone. And, and uh, were there some Q&A 
Um, I guess we actually probably need to transition now to the second phase of the, pre of the overall meeting. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, guys, cool. you can reach out to Ben um, on oh, yeah. Twitter, LinkedIn, hit him up, read his books. Uh, you know, such a great, great uh, person in our community. Um, and so uh, definitely continue to follow Ben uh, long after today's session. So with that, uh, I do have the great opportunity to introduce Karen. Karen's got an exciting uh, piece of news for us. Uh, Karen, tell us about what you're going to be doing coming up. Um, what, I guess, Friday, tomorrow? What am I doing Friday? Are you doing, um, I thought you were doing a presentation or did you already? Oh, you already oh, okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, I have, um, I do have a BizConnect presentation tomorrow. If, you haven't heard of, um, a, there's a YouTube channel run by Tableau called BizConnect. And I had actually never heard of it before they reached out and asked me to present, but it's phenomenal. They have a lot of speakers. I think they put out a video every week. So um, I am doing that tomorrow. Looking forward to that. Awesome. All right. And now I will hand the ball over to you. Sure. Okay. So this, um, slide was really just to wrap up the conversation um, with Ben on um, the data literacy topic. That was um, a, an event that we had at work at Chick-fil-A and Chick-fil-A certainly doesn't have it all figured out with data literacy, but I definitely thought this was something that other companies could certainly do and try. And it seems like it's on the right path. We had a week-long data literacy showcase um, and feature different cross-functional teams and groups that kind of like help the organization move through the pandemic using data. So here are some screenshots at the bottom. I presented along with some folks from um, our enterprise analytics team on forecasting sales, what was happening with sales, watching all the numbers, um, and anyway, I feel like that's certainly something that could be done anywhere. And it really kind of tied in with a lot of what Ben was saying. Um, but I think next up, we have Will Strauss. Will, um, you guys are gonna love his presentation. Will is a Tableau ambassador and one of the leaders of the Boston Tableau user group. And he works as a business intelligence engineer at Amazon Robotics. And he also runs a family farm. He's gonna tell us a little more about this, um, but they grow live, they raise livestock, grow produce in Southern New Hampshire. So thank you so much for being here, Will. I'll turn it over to you. Hey, Will, I can't hear you. I think you might be on mute or something. Let's see. I'm not muted yet. There you go. Now you're good. Okay. Right, you're good. You're good now. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Great. Um, so uh, anyway, I, it's such an honor to be uh, Atlanta Tug uh, to be here. The Atlanta Tug is such a great tablet user group, and sharing the stage with Ben Jones. It was a a terrific conversation. Uh, there's so many data professionals on here, and we're trying to balance, you know, expanding data literacy across networks and in our workspace. I'm glad I was paired with Ben because my hope is to talk a little bit about your non-work life and how that can be impacted by data too. So let me see if I can get this share screen to work and I'll turn it off so you stop looking at my mug. Okay. And I'm hoping you guys can see my presentation at this point. Um, so I'll get started. So again, hello, my name is Will Strauss. Uh, I visit for fun, not just for work. Uh, I love data art. Uh, I love the Tableau community. Uh, I'm a first year Tableau user group ambassador representing the Boston Tug and I'm a member of the Veterans Advocacy Tug. Uh, I'm not an armed service veteran, just the son of one, uh, but that doesn't matter because if um, the Veterans Advocacy Tug is uh, for anyone who wants to join, so please join us there. 
since April of this year. So in 2020 Amazonian time, like 179 years ago, uh, I started working for the solutions and analytics engineering BI team at Amazon Robotics. We develop uh, data analytics and visualization tools to support AR robotic systems across the globe. The technologies are mind blowing. And while I love my leadership team, uh, my SAE BI team, uh, and I'd be happy to chat about anyone curious about working for AR, this presentation is not about robots, so sorry. Um, you may have heard me talk about data farming on Zach Bowder's Data Plus Love podcast, uh, at the NOLA tug, uh, the New Orleans tug, the Buffalo tug on Twitter, or like within the first 10 minutes of any conversation with me, but I'm really excited, excited to share some new visualizations and give some updates for anyone that's been following our family's data story. Uh, if you have no idea who I am, even better. Uh, my goal today is again, not to teach you really anything new and mind blowing about Tableau. This is our anecdote. Uh, it's our personal story about becoming closer to nature using data visualization and analytics. So why small farming? Well, there's farming, there's, there's countless paths between these two, but we really felt like it was either no tech or high tech and all the attention was paid on how you were producing your electricity. Um, We've always tried to do the daily green things like recycling. We bought a hybrid car a while back, uh, turning lights off, conserving water, but we had no way to really quantify our footprint aside from our utility bills. So what was the straightest path for us to stay in society while knowing we were putting our best foot forward in terms of living a sustainable life? We learned about a huge gap in sustainable development and the ultimate headwind really for farming. Farming is a tough game. The average age of farmers is like quarter past dead because one to 5% of your stock or crop is worth more than the rest combined. Now we'll talk about that later, but let's look at this. 40% of every seed you sow or livestock you raise gets tossed. Imagine if everyone who shopped at Amazon this holiday season left two out of five packages for the garbage man to pick up. 95% of that gets composed, uh, decomposed in landfills, which means anaerobically, which releases methane. And we all know that's a greenhouse gas that traps heat 20 times at the rate of CO2. To put that $165 billion into perspective, that's more food than the United States imports or exports in a year. All the while, one in 10 Americans experience food insecurity. So there's a, there's a huge gap here and it's clearly a moral issue. Now I'm focusing these stats in the United States, but if you wanna learn more about sustainable de development goals, see amazing visualizations that are built with these topics, please go check out um, the SDG Viz project. I'm showing a visualization, uh, visualization here by co-lead uh, Vindu Kumar. And it's a beautiful visualization. It ties food waste and hunger together. So uh, also shout out to Brian Moore, Jackie Moore, the Morris, they're from Boston. Uh, they're co-leads with the Boston Tableau User Group and this project. So if you want to learn more about global um, sustainable goals, go there. Why are we wasting so much food, particularly in America? I like to call this the Cezanne effect. And I think this is something we all know. So thanks to my favorite French artist in the advertising industry, American shoppers have completely unreasonable expectations for their food. Only one to 5% of peaches, for example, I'm talking to Georgia, so we'll go with peaches, are number one peaches. The number two peaches, in terms of their grading, are worth 75 to 90% less. So many medium sized to small side orchards choose to leave those twos and threes on the ground and rot, and because it's not even worth the labor to go pick them up. In grocery stores, if the canvas of the produce aisle is not perfectly composed, even more goes to waste. Shoppers don't like stragglers. Another area of waste uh, related to food, not including that 165 billion is animal waste. Unfortunately, the blame tends to go to the animals. Before we, become data farm, or before we became data farmers, we spent our free time hiking, kayaking, bird watching, and not once in nature had we seen a 500 million gallon poop lagoon with 5,000 herbivores living their entire lives right next to it. Now that the velocity and frequency of seasonal storms hitting the Gulf Coast, the Mississippi River Valley, and the Carolinas are increasing, water table contamination is an annual threat. That picture in the bottom left corner is a hog farm 
where all of their waste lagoons were put into the local water system because of a flood. Don't forget that the animals are drinking that same contaminated water. They're in, enduring an existence contrary to millennia of evolution. When we started learning about raising livestock, we could see the difference in some of the books would use the term growing instead of raising. And it kind of reinforced this idea that you could take an animal like you would an ear of corn, plant it in the ground, it would grow, and then you would harvest it. What's important to note here is that we're not you know, with the right farming practices, we can produce more food that is more nutritious and respects the animals. So we're not talking about getting rid of any animals or getting rid of Chick-fil-A. Karen, I'm going to mention Chick-fil-A. I love it. Seriously, I would really love a gift card. So <laughs> when we had finally saved up uh, to buy our first home, we picked this spot. Um, it's a little ugly. Uh, but you can see why we picked it. So like most small farmers, we live at home. It's about six and a half acres. And where we live is these sort of rolling hills between the Monadnock Mountain Range and the Nashua River Valley. So it's, we get a lot of wind. It's very cold because it's in New Hampshire. And we started with specializing in livestock versus produce. I'm not sure how much you know about New Hampshire, but so we're about like 950 miles northeast of Atlanta. Uh, we're called the Granite State. So we had this, uh, essentially New Hampshire was carved out by the Laurentide Ice Sheet 20,000 years ago, exposing the mountain ranges. And we have a lot of granite quarries. And we had this beautiful rock formation called the Old Man of the Mountain. And it looked like an old man's face. It was beautiful. And it fell, fell off in 2003, which just devastated the state. And they made these really cool profilers. So if you go there now, you can stand on a spot and kind of look down the barrel of these steel beams that have these contoured edges on them and it recreates that kind of three-dimensional view of what the face looked like so that's really cool it's a big thing to know about new hampshire is the old man of the mountain uh we're also known for politics we're the first to primary uh my alma mater st anselm college and my wife's alma mater uh they host debates every year um i'll say that we are not america we're like 90 percent white fourth in medium income and 40th in gdp so there's a lot of there's a lot of bedroom communities in Southern New Hampshire. I just wanna make sure we're early to vote, but we really don't represent America. We're a small state, we know that. Uh, we, it does mean that in primary season, there's a lot of candidates all around. So that's me with Tulsi Gabbert and her sister V, who I talked to for a while, wearing some Tableau swag in a local coffee shop. We did have a president, Franklin Pierce. There's still a college named after him. He's best known for being a doe face, which means he was a northerner who supported slavery. Um, just telling it like it is. Our most famous president is definitely uh, Jeb Bartlett from the West Wing. And if you ask anybody, he's still the most popular president in American history. Our state tree is the paper birch, which is you know one of my top three favorite tree species. And yes, I'm the kind of guy who has a favorite tree species list. We love irony. So you can see the old man on the mountain still being used even though it fell off using our slogan, live free or die. And all those are printed out in prisons. And our state bird is a purple finch, isn't he dapper? So here's management. I'll start with the humans first. Uh, on the top right is my wife, Carrie. She's really the, the owner and head farmer. She does most of the work. She's absolutely amazing. And I wanna wish her a happy birthday. It was her birthday uh, this last week. Uh, my daughter, Abigail on the left there, she's an animal whisperer. My son, Henry says he's a builder, but he's more of a demo master. Uh, our Alpha chicken, our alpha rooster right there. Disco is our head of security. We have a beaver that keeps our pond level a little higher than I'd like, but he does a good job in the drought season. And our LGDs, Khaleesi and Hodor. I get asked this a lot. What does LGD mean? It means livestock guardian dog. Uh, they're bred to be intelligent, independent watchdogs bonded to the flock. You can even see Khaleesi as a kind of a puppy here, watching chickens eat out of her food bowl and not eating them, which was great restraint. And they're big enough to take on bobcats, coyotes, black bears. Um, their bark is usually enough to keep them away. And also out here in New Hampshire, like rural New Hampshire, big dogs are good, little dogs are food. So let me show you the place and we'll get into some tableau. So it's only six and a half acres, but it felt massive when we started planning. My first paying job was as a land surveyor's assistant, and I learned a little trick and a lot of identifying and describing land features and vegetation groups. So let's jump over to Tableau, I'll show you the layout. So 
So this is our farm. You saw that picture earlier. And what we did is we used this great tool, a drying tool from Interworks. And I'll, I'll kind of pop that up after when we use a polygon function. And so what you can see here is we drew outlines around a satellite photo of our property, identifying different pasture areas. So here's a house, we point north. That pond you saw is our most dominant land feature. Uh, it's anywhere between 25 to 40 million gallons of water. It's stone line spring fed, it depends on what time of season it is, what the water level is. Our second largest feature is this giant northern pasture, which was just all grass. The red areas are ones that we chose to avoid. So one is our septic tank. Obviously we're not gonna plant or build over that. And uh, we chose to segregate an area for protected nesting sites. I'm just gonna jump back into this. So again, big shout out to, to this tool. Uh, I, I'm trying to show the three functions of this. So we could do points, paths, or polygons. You can import an image or look up on the map and export a table and just bring it into Tableau. So once we had it kind of laid out, the best advice that we got from old farmers and gardeners was to don't start planting anything. You can get some chickens and stuff first, but go look and see what's already growing there. It's gonna give you an indication of what grows well there. And if you fit a niche in the local farmer's market. So we went around and we found silverberries in the top left, also called autumn olive, wild grape, we had a peach tree, some cider apple trees, uh, some nice grass diversity, but we wanted to increase that. On the bottom right, it's spring carrots. Have you ever seen Queen Anne's lace? If you know that, in early spring, that's actually a, a carrot. You can eat that. And there's my son in the top right munching out on cattails, those little tall grass that grow in wetlands. You can eat that from root to tip. Our pasture exploded with wildflowers, dandelions, baby's breath, aster. We shared the pastures with a lot of animals. So we found multiple species of uh, songbird, pasture bird, we had bats, great bioindicators like these frogs, snakes to eat the frogs. That's a little uh, monarch caterpillar in the top right corner. My favorite pasture species that we found is this endangered species of blackbird related to the more common red or yellow winged blackbirds. And I thought those yellow hat heads were like mating displays. But when we watched them, the spring pasture, they would actually disappear. It was perfect camouflage, to look like a dandelion. I just thought that was really cool and we were excited that we had an endangered species. I say the term pasture and not long, very specifically. Lawns are wasteful, unproductive monocultures that require constant fertilization and microbiome sterilization to look like a fairway. These are bad. Anyway, to the pond. We shared the pond with a lot of animals too. Frogs, ducks, migratory birds, amphibians, otters, the beaver. We found dangers too. The American kestrel in that top left corner is really no threat to the flock. It's about the size of a blue jay, but the bald eagle underneath it and the red-shouldered hawk next to it definitely were. That bobcat in the bottom left, his name is Robert Felix, took at least a half dozen ducks and chickens, including our two alpha roosters. So Denzel and Sean Claire that you saw earlier, yeah, they got killed. Um, really the big threats were these plants in the middle. So the oriental bittersweet, uh, Celestris orbilicatus, is an invasive species. It's terrible in the Northeast. It rips down trees and you see those bright berries. Anything that looks like that in the dead of winter when everything is starving, you know is toxic. And you see those delicious berries on the right. These are highly nutritious silverberries. And these are not. These are deadly nightshade, and we have kids and we have animals. That's the Tropa belladonna. So we had to kind of map that, and we wanted to look at what we had available for timber, what we had if we had any sugar maples or something we could use, and also what the impact of these toxic plant species are. So we made another visualization. So this I kind of have pre-filtered to those silverberries, those delicious little red self-fermenting berries that are superfoods and make great mead and wine. And our kids love to pick. See here, they grow all over our property. The problem is, is that those little red berries, the deadly nightshade and the bittersweet grow amongst them. 
So we had some really clear paths in, through our first winter and spring that we had to both clear these species as best as, best as we could and introduce species like wild grape and creeping vine to compete with them uh, because there's really no way to totally eradicate them. We did find some other cool stuff like our state tree is represented very well. To our pasture down here, we actually had some uh, saplings come up, so we're gonna let that procreate. And here's our apple trees. And like I said, that maple tree that the turkey is gonna fly to was red maple. Anyway, you get the idea. So we built this visualization, we went out and surveyed. I could open up this drawing tool on my tablet and input the locations as I walked around. And it was really simple. And this helped us make a lot of decisions about not only where we could plant stuff, but you know, available timber. And like we said, the, the threat of, of, of course, the tick berries. So given the space we had, we chose to have two different pasture groups. We had a free range flock of ducks, geese, turkeys, and chickens, along with more controlled groups uh, of rabbits and chickens that we would move around in tractors. This is a great visualization by Zen Master John Smith uh, for his 2019 Iron Viz entry where he does a great breakdown across the United States of this balance between pasture and cropland. Essentially, we decided to start with all pasture land to prepare uh, certain planting areas to become cropland. So we got some chicks in the mail. Yep, they'll mail them out to you. And I got a Dale chick here, his name is Chanticleer. He is a redhead right down the middle. There's my son, Henry, and he's so young, you can even see the egg tooth on the tip of his beak. As they grew up, they went right out into uh, the pasture and started pecking and scratching and living as chickens do. At that big pond, uh, we raised our goslings and ducks inside and then brought them outside. I did not enjoy raising ducklings inside. They drink a lot of water and they're messy eaters. And we also had turkeys. If you don't know anything about turkeys, they roost. Our Narragansett turkeys are very closely related to wild turkeys. So they'll roost on your shoulder, roost on your leg, roost on power lines. And if you thought that it was crazy that this one was roosting on the top of our barn slash garage, you might have not noticed the one on top of the 150 foot tall red maple tree about 70 yards away. So we started with rabbits for our tractor stock. So these were enclosed units that we were going to move around. Why do we start with rabbits? Because they're adorable. Come with moms, which is a really big evolutionary advantage. Uh, the kits are totally dependent on their mothers for food and water and warmth. We know moms are awesome in general, but we have a much deeper appreciation uh, of how amazing they are when we got our shipment of ducks, who we had to totally care for. Uh, we had to be their moms, feed them, water them, bathe them, and share a tub, which was pretty gross, uh, but I need to scrub it anyway. Rabbit's delicious. If you haven't had rabbit before, it's exactly the same as cooking skinless chicken. There's a slightly nutty flavor to it. You can roast it, fry it, stick it in a stew. We love eating rabbit, and so do raw diet dogs chose silver fox rabbits because they have this, they're a rare heritage breed and they're perfectly suited for our cold, windy climate. Their pelts are really soft and warm. And as you can see here, they're very valuable. Our biggest inspiration for the pasturing method is famed farmer and author Joel Saladin from Polyface Farm in Virginia. He has so many great books, uh, TED Talk on how grass and herbivores can essentially save the planet and uh, several how-to guides for constructing uh, mobile pasture structures. So the idea is that we're taking these rabbits, putting them in structures and moving them in paths around the property. Some of the variables or controls that we had is that rabbits really shouldn't be run over the same patch as another family group in the same summer to avoid transmission of diseases. Chickens could go anywhere, but they don't control where they poop like rabbits. Do. Rabbits will poop kind of in a pile in the run area where chickens will just poop everywhere. Larger structures for us had to be aerodynamic because we have so much wind. So we chose to buy these geodesic climbing domes to use as dome tractors for our chickens and our grow out rabbits. And then those little slide hutches because they have little nesting boxes for our breeding kit. And we use the path function 
of this drawing tool to organize and track how we moved our animals across the pasture. So what you're seeing here is our first group of five hutches and now comes in our first chicken tractor. Those chickens are going off in an area, eating everything that they come in contact with, where you can see that we brought those rabbit tractors where we used to have that ugly, disgusting monoculture lawn grass. You see a little overlap. I'm gonna talk about why we did that later, but now we're bringing the rabbits all the way around that beautiful maple tree in the middle of our pasture. The chickens, that hutch, that dome was a little <laughs> tougher to move than we thought. So he kind of would shimmy it around and get about a quarter of it every on. So I, I kind of reduced the frequency as we were recording this. You can see the rabbits are still moving to pasture. And right now we're in late December. Last grass is in and we had our first big storm. Here was one of the first mistakes we made is that we brought all the rabbits into this barn slash garage and put the, the hutches on top of pallets. They were still pooping and urinating the whole time. So we had a daily task of now shoveling out all this black gold, these little gold nuggets, cold compost, perfect garden compost. And it built up over time. We've this year kind of reconfigured and wind protected the structure so the rabbits are gonna be outside. But again, just in all honesty, here's where we probably could have done things differently. Now, as we go into the next year, you can see we basically we were able to bring in uh, another dome, and we actually bought a, a third dome as well, where we would bring in groups of meat chickens along with our grow outs. We did kind of double back over areas, again, using this tool we knew that we didn't cover in the pasture. And we also kind of were able to segregate family groups and make sure that uh, we weren't transmitting diseases. The outcome of this is that we were able to actively pasture over one acre of our property. And if you look there, I basically calculated this using the rate that rabbits, chickens, and ducks poop uh, with the number that we had at any given point on our pasture over time and came up with a cumulative fertilizer deposit of almost one and a half tons of the good stuff. Why were these tractors so great? Well, we got to use the whole chicken. Chickens, we would supplement their feed uh, with bird seed and they turned out to be their best farmers. What they didn't eat was pooped on and stepped on in the soil as they were scratching it and stepping on it. And by mid spring, we had sunflowers and feed corn and grain popping up behind them. Just so you know, rabbits love sunflowers, probably even more than carrots. Uh, and the seeds contain fatty acids and oils that promote good skin and coat health. What did we get out of this? We get enough meat to feed our family of four through the entire long coming winter. It, enough animal product to sell on top of that to pay for supplemental feed and those two new pasture tractors. We also got so many eggs. Uh, there's a massive difference between a farm fresh egg and one from your grocery store. So the eggs that I eat in the morning and I've lost a bunch of weight just eating eggs, um, they're a day old, <laughs> day old duck eggs. When you get them in the grocery store, they're about five to eight weeks old. Excess is easy to deal with. Uh, I don't love pickled eggs, but there's plenty of recipes out there. Egg cubes are convenient and good for baking recipes. Uh, you could fill up a few freezer bags, lay them flat, and use those for scrambies. Now, you see how I did the little eggs cubed in the 2D eggs there? Yeah, I thought that was clever. I want you to know I thought that was clever before I tell you that these salted egg yolks in the middle, um, you dry them in cheesecloth and you shave them onto pasta or soups and salads, and it's like Parmesan cheese, creamy, savory, uh, and they are not glazed apricots or butterscotch candies like I thought they were. And popped one in my mouth, and it's essentially like putting a whole shaker of salt in your mouth. So like I said, you know, a clever. I don't have an egg viz. Uh, unfortunately, I started tracking our egg totals uh, every day with all kinds of metrics like size, volume, double yolkers, color, possible parent, 
one summer hit, we were gathering a dozen a day and started selling them as quick as we could gather them. And I just lost track. So our plan is to maintain a viz really inspired by one of my favorite peer people, Lindsay Betts and all. Uh, she has this great circle of influenza, which shows kind of the phenology of the influenza virus. And we wanted to use this to show eggs because we did notice, you know, seasonal peaks and valleys in terms of uh, egg production as forage was more or less available. And if anybody knows how to make a really cool ellipse, like an egg or, you know, like the path around the sun, uh, let me know. I'd love to know how to do that. I have no idea. So we have have a long way to hit our goals. We're very proud of Silver Fox Farm. I hope a few of you have at least entertained the idea of becoming data farmers too. And here's how we recommend starting. Join a CSA. This stands for Community Supported Agriculture. These are your small farmers around you. You do a quick search. I looked at localharvest.org. It gave me 51 results around Atlanta. Small farmers were really, really hit when restaurants closed because those nice little booty places were supplied by local farms that are no longer serving. So please invest in your food, invest in your local farming, go learn your farmer's name. It's really quick. Just Google search CSAs near me now. Get some chickens. Even a small little hutch that you could buy at Petco or somewhere, you could put it in your residential pasture, not yard. Move them around, you'll get eggs all year. They'll reduce your food waste incredibly. Few notes, chickens don't like to eat candy, chocolate, or junk food, like you were gonna throw that away anyway. Really moldy stuff, put in your compost. Onions in big quantities aren't great, but if you have like, you know, pulled pork or something from the other night, brisket, they won't worry about it. Nightshades and avocados aren't terrific. They're better for your compost anyway. Everything else is good, including, you know, cooked turkey, cooked quail, turkey duck, goose, and yes, chicken. If you are gonna do some planting this year, this is one of my favorite visits of all time by Jade Wimpy. It's a beautiful planting count, uh, calendar. People have taken up really useless hobbies in COVID. There used to be a thing called Victory Gardens. Let's plant some COVID gardens this year and use this tool. You can input your planting season, what planting method, do you wanna plant in spring, do you wanna plant in summer? And you can look at what vegetables or, or produce that you want to grow and customize a planting calendar. I love this fizz. We used it to do a couple of our test gardens this year. And if you only have like two square feet of residential pasture, you can make one of these potato towers and get yourself two square feet of potatoes and only you know, two square feet. So this is the end of my presentation. Before I take questions, um, we really wanted to thank you all so much for listening to our data story. Then the next chapter for us is getting some pasture pigs and milk and goats to tackle the untouched half of the northern pasture and eat up our fallen cider apples. Uh, we're building a large geodesic greenhouse uh, that will be lit and heated by a battery charged by a wind turbine kit and start planting our first market garden. And all those rabbit holes that we had, Doug, yeah, that's where we're going to plant trees. They kind of made that decision for us. So please follow us. Um, you can find me at Twitter at datanotdoctrine.com. But again, the boss of this whole thing is my wife, Carrie. So please follow us on Instagram or in Facebook at silverfoxfarm.h. And that, I think, is my time. Thank you so much. Well, this was awesome. There were so many comments about how cool it was to hear Tab a tableau being used like this. This is something that like you don't think of all the time using it in a personal way. This this was fascinating. And we have six acres of land. We live like in a suburb of Atlanta, south of Atlanta. So you really got me thinking like, perhaps I could do something like this. This would be really cool. I you can do it. You. You wanna, I think Joel Saladin's first book was called You Can Farm. Everybody <laughs> can do this. Like. Even an herb garden in your window is gonna prevent a huge amount of food waste. Um, so yeah. really, again, we wanna be sustainable. I can't afford a Tesla truck, so I just got some chickens. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> your humor, Will, I love it. Well, we wanna wish everybody happy holidays, Merry Christmas. We will see you all in January. 
um, for our next meeting. And please check out um, the ATUG Slack channel for more information on the Iron Viz contest. And we hope that you're excited to participate. And if you have questions, please make sure you just post any questions out on um, Slack and we'll all be sure to chime in and help you any way we can. If you wanna form a team, that would be another great place to start um, trying to find teammates or data. Thanks everybody. Here's to 2021. We will see you on the other side. The other side. <laughs> Bye. That's right. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thanks, Will. Great job, man.